Here now on two, the second of three programmes looking at the impact of technological change on one industry in one town. The right to work? Increasingly, man is developing machines that put men out of work. This is an automatic glass cutting machine. It costs £93,000. It cuts glass four or five times quicker than if it were cut by hand. It makes these men redundant. It robs them of the right to work. If you've worked in the glass industry for 40 years, the implications of this new technology take some understanding. Bill Bradburn. I've seen a lot of jobs go out, and it's deplorable. I don't blame any company trying to introduce technological change, but we're getting to that state now where if Pilkington's mentioning investment in the town, we're wondering then how many jobs are going to be lost. Pilkington brothers employ 12,000 people in the town of St Helens in Lancashire, one man in every four. In many ways, the company is St Helens. Everything you can now see is owned by Pilkingtons. They've made glass here for 150 years and they're still expanding. They're building a new factory costing 70 million pounds. But it's a factory that sums up the dilemma of the new technology. This is the old sheet glass works where Bill Bradburn is union convener. 600 men make sheet glass here, but by 1981, the new factory, called UK5, should be doing the same job as the old works and doing it with only 400 men. Net loss, then, 200 jobs over two years. Jobs in Bill Bradburn's factory. The investment in UK5 bothers him. It's like the cure, it's egg. Good in parts, bad in parts. The parts that are good are that it will consolidate the future of the glass industry in St. Helens. The bad part is the threat to jobs or the job loss. I can see St. Helens, if something isn't done, becoming a, a, a barren area. I'm not a Luddite, and neither are any of the members in my branch who are responsible people. We know that technological change has to be, otherwise we would never have had a motor car, we would never have had a, well, an electric fire and anything else. That's progress, but what we want is to harness that technological change to create jobs and not to abolish jobs. Glass making came to St Helens because the raw materials, the sand, the limestone, the coal, were already in the ground. Over the years, it's brought prosperity and insulation even from the cold drafts of the Depression. But now, for the first time since the 1930s, the town is beginning to doubt the industry's ability to sustain full employment. Is what's best for the company necessarily what's best for the town? Pilkingtons have always been willing to grasp new methods, if only to remain competitive. For instance, 50 years ago, rolled glass became distorted by imperfections as it cooled. It needed to be ground and polished, first on one side, then on the other. So the company transformed the production line. They began grinding and polishing simultaneously on both sides. Later, they also perfected a method of drawing up molten glass rather like treacle. They called it sheet glass, and Pilkington sheet glass sold all over the world. At their peak, Pilkingtons were employing 17,000 men in St Helens. It was a time of plenty. By 1959, Pilkington brothers were employing 15,000 people here in St Helens. And in that year, they achieved a breakthrough that was to establish them as world leaders. They began to manufacture float glass, glass that was made in a continuous strip that floated through the furnace on a bed of molten tin. The whole world wanted float glass and still want it. The glass is the most perfect yet produced. It needs no grinding, no polishing. The machinery hurries on, relentlessly spilling out glass in a continuous flow, 24 hours a day, for five years without a major overhaul. The process is controlled by computer. 
So successful is float glass that foreign competitors pay Pilkington's license fees to manufacture it abroad. The company made £90 million pre-tax profits last year. £38 million of that came from the license fees on float glass. But even in success stories, there are snags. The latest float glass tank produces 60 square metres of glass per man per hour. That's the way it's measured in the industry. Yet, there's not one man in sight. Unlike even 30 years ago, when men worked 50, 60, 70 hours a week. New technology brings a fresh twist to unemployment, for it grips not only failing firms, but companies that are fat with success, firms like Pilkington's. Mick Lyons is a labourer looking for a job. Today, he visits Bill Bradburn's office to renew his union card so that he may take work at Pilkington's, which will last 13 weeks. Yes, you're a few bobbin in here, Mick. Well, anyway, when's your first, your first payday be next week, Warmer? We can find it. So you call in your first payday on that warm at your pocket. In the next room, six other men wait to hear their chances of getting a job. Brian, how long have you been out of work? Four months. How about you, Jim? This last time, nearly three months. But out of uh, the three years, I've worked eight months. Mick? About three months. I was on the same contract as him. Malcolm? Seven months. Seven months? Seven months. November. Mike? Eighteen months. What's your trade? I'm just a labourer. Peter? I've been out two and a half years. Is it over two and a half years? I'm a labourer by trade. Mm -hmm. What impact does that have on you, that sort of experience? Well, it... it you know, you just get sick of going round and round keep getting refused, you know, and, you know, you, you feel demoralised, like, you know, just... You, you just get that way, you, you say, oh, I'll, I'll give it up, you know. Mike, how long have you been out of work? Two years. Did you stay in Britain? I believe you went abroad looking for a job. Yeah, I went to, uh, I went to Germany for six weeks, because there's no work over here, so we had to go over there, you see. Pilkingtons themselves have expanded abroad into a multinational company. They've built float glass plants in Sweden and Brazil, and they're investing in an optical company in Australia, all of which concerns the citizens of St Helens. For the truth is that today, St Helens need Pilkingtons, but Pilkingtons don't necessarily need St Helens, even though the company retains a special relationship with the town. Pilkington's Choral Society. They sing of age-old values, tried and trusted, when the world seemed a simpler place. But how will the traditional patterns of life be retained when, in St Helens, almost a tenth of the workforce is currently unemployed? How can they survive when unemployment in Merseyside as a whole is 12%, more than twice as high as the national average? It's my husband that concerns me mostly. He's worked at Pilkington's for nearly 40 years and is now having to think of going to another firm for a job. 
which he doesn't want to do. He likes working at Pilkington's. He likes the friends he works with. It's uprooting his whole life. He's got to change his whole life at 54 years of age, which we never dreamt would happen to him after working for the firm from leaving school at 14 years of age. We haven't got the same atmosphere at work we used to have when the factory was at the, behind us and uh, we were working uh, with the production at the back of us. All the men are uh, they're, uh, undecided what to do. We've thought of moving from town, moving home, and but there are other concerns at home with other people to consider at home. But uh, it shouldn't have to happen at his time of life after working there so long. Our children, there's not much hope for them in the area as regards work. How many children have you? I have two daughters. I have a daughter in the head office at Pilkington's, and uh, she has a son, and where he goes from here, I don't know, because uh, I don't know about whether there'll be any jobs for him. If he comes through his examinations, where does he go from here? You see, only abroad, like everybody else. Torquay, May 1979, the annual conference of the biggest union in the glass industry, the General and Municipal Workers. In Pilkingtons too, we face the challenge of new technology, and it is possible on the rough assessments we've already made that one in four jobs could be affected within a very short space of time, with all the serious consequences that that could mean for our members and their families. In ICI, David Warburton, the union's national industrial officer, spells out the union attitudes. If they were going to accept the new technology, they were also going to exact a price, at the very least, a reduction in the working week, and they were prepared to fight for it. It's very easy to put our hand, head in the sands on issues like change and technology and so on, but the problem won't go away, and we shouldn't resist logical change. And if I may paraphrase something Hugh Gateskill once said, in the interests of our members, their families and the nation, we should be prepared to fight and fight and fight again to defend the interests of those we serve. I commend my report to Congress. These men are in the front line of the union's tactics. They're conveners at the various Pilkington's factories. Ron Jones from the City Roadworks and Brian Roberts, vice chairman of the negotiating committee. Charlie Williams from the North Wales factory and back in St Helens, Albert Donovan of Fiberglass. Jackie Roberts from the factory making float glass and Bill Bradburn, conscious of the growing pressure to share what work there is. It's because at his factory most jobs are at risk. In the future the priority must be a shorter working week. Not of 38 hours, not even 35 hours, but 32. We want the 32-hour week. Nothing short will save the glass industry which has been hammered into the ground. And I am not prepared to see it hammered anymore. And I'm glad to stand with David. And I hope he carries it. But on the 35-hour week, pure, unadulterated rubbish doesn't create one job. Creates five hours for the people who are in work. Creates nothing for the people who are outside in an industry that's based on a 40-hour week, you've got to speak in reductions of multiples of eight hours to put working days, not working hours, working days, and put a fifth of the workforce back in. And I hope David remembers this. And I will stand by him, and my branch will fight. We've fought before, we'll fight again. And strength to your arm, David. You're doing a good job this year. Carry on. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Congress.
the thinking behind the union's national strategy was this. If they were going to win a shorter working week for their members, they were going to have to persuade at least one leading company that it was a good idea. They chose Pilkington Brothers for one simple reason. They believe that Pilkingtons, with pre-tax profits of £90 million, can afford a shorter working week. And further, that they might be persuaded to afford it. The industrialist attitude is very different. To pay men even the same wages for working fewer hours simply doesn't make economic sense. It would increase the cost of each product and make it more difficult to sell, particularly abroad. It would make Britain even less competitive. So, this is a test case. If Pilkingtons were to concede, the implications for the rest of British industry are immense. Anyway, the overriding debate at Congress was the debate on unemployment and technological change in Britain today. And what I do so is... full employment matters more than fat wage packets, and Bill Bradburn stresses to his branch committee the priorities and implications forced on the unions by this new industrial revolution. Where the hell we go when the microchips do come, I don't know. I, I did read the article in the mirror this morning where we may all be sat at home all week while the microchips are making this and making that and making the other. I think that's cloud cuckoo land. I think it's utopia. I think there always have to be some people. But what hours those people work at the end of the day should be dictated by the unions. Since what, 71, we had, what, 11,000 employed in Pilkingtons? Yeah, in that Vincent area. Helen, you know, yeah. What is it down to now, around about six? That's you know, safe. you could argue that microchips have been with us since 71. Yeah. What have we been doing since then? I know we've been arguing. What's everybody else doing? It's yeah, well, what it wants, I think, is the government to set up some kind of a committee to look into the 32-hour week. I agree with you that 35-hour week's a waste of time. When we spoke to Pilkingtons on the shorter working week, they replied that, well, they didn't particularly want to be the leaders in, in this field. And so have others. Other industries have said that. And in the strategy of persuasion, Bradburn enlists the aid of an improbable ally. And I'll still go back to Kissinger's statement. And Kissinger is a capitalist. You're all aware of him. And his statement, in essence, was that technological change causes job loss, which in turn creates anarchy. It's as simple as that. Next day, at Pilkington's headquarters, the union arrive to put their case to the company's board. They ask Pilkington's three questions. How much will they pay as a wage increase? Will they consider a gradual reduction of working hours to 32 hours a week? And third, will they consider granting employees early retirement? The meeting lasts all day. It ends in deadlock. The company offer what the union interpret as a 9% increase. They also offer to introduce early retirement at 63, a measure that would cost them four million pounds a year. But on the shorter working week, they offer nothing. So how did it go? Not very well, not very well. We're not surprised, not surprised at the reaction. But they made it abundantly clear that so far as they're concerned, as of today, there's no question in moving toward the reduction in, in hours. And therefore we said, well, there's no point in us continuing the negotiations on that issue at this stage, because we're not in the same ball game. The response is ridiculous. I don't think they're taking us seriously as far as the technology is concerned. Their response to that was outrageous. Well, I have to personally think that uh, on the new technology one, the, the figures they presented to us today about talking about losing 1,400 jobs and not off offsetting it by a, any reduction in hours, certainly unlikely. I think it shows a, a lack of imagination on their part. I don't think that they quite realise how serious we are about this issue. And that's the disappointing thing about today. I don't think they've got the message yet. We'll have to make sure they get it fairly soon. Well. St Helens isn't renowned for industrial conflict. The relationship between town and company has traditionally been as calm as a summer evening. The two top teams in the Pilkington's Bowls League test each other out in competition for the David Pilkington Trophy. That afternoon, Pilkington's had announced that they would be giving £75 to every employee and pensioner to celebrate 21 years' success for float glass. 
The unions know that this cosy relationship with the company weakens the workers' willingness to consider any form of industrial action. So while some may forecast industrial strife, more remember the company in their good works and dismiss or don't comprehend the complex threats to jobs in the years ahead. Well, I'm going back now to 1932 when I first started at Burlington's. And the married men with children in those days, they used to get family allowance from Burlington's themselves. What do you mean? Well, they, uh, for each child, they got five shillings, which today is 25p. And uh, they paid that out every Wednesday. So that a married man, I, I knew one that worked with me who had 13 boys. And he got five shillings for every one of them. So that he had a good payday on a Wednesday and he also had a good payday on a Friday. He hardly needed to work at all? He hardly, he hardly needed to work. And many times he had one off, you know, during the week. And uh, that was a wonderful thing in those days. Bernard, what is the firm to you? The firm to me is, well, my life at the moment, because uh, well, I've worked there since leaving school 15, which is 23 years. Anybody who works at Perkinson's, whether it is special, they're very, very good to their employees, um, sickness-wise. Um, we, I have a colleague of mine in the bowls team who had an accident last year, cut the tendons in his hand, was off work for, I don't know, probably about eight, eight months. And uh, Pilkington's looked after him excellently. Harry, you will have heard the firm described as paternalistic. It can sometimes be used as a word of criticism. Yes. What do you think? Well, I don't, I don't think they would use that word with Pilkington's if it was uh, in that year. Um, I don't know anyone who can hold anything against Pilkington's at all. And uh, when you go into work and there's thousands of people working in the same factory, um, you're quite sure that they're all of the same mind, that they're working for a very, very good firm. But soon, fewer and fewer people will be working in the factories, for the automated machines cut jobs and create new tensions as simply as they deal with the huge glass sheets. The Bystronic cutting machine is made in Switzerland because Britain doesn't produce competitively a similar machine. It's controlled by computer, and here at this firm at Alfreton in Derbyshire, it's already helped to reduce the workforce by 10%. Reg Duggan was a glass cutter before the Bystronic arrived. Now he controls it, or rather he feeds in the information which helps it make the maximum use of each sheet of glass. Well, fantastic machine, really. This is, it's, um, it's saved a lot of actual manual work. It's, um, it's a lot faster than manual work. How long did you actually cut glass by hand? Six years. Did you ever think that you'd be doing this? No. Sta no. Standing here while the machine did it for no. you? No way. I don't think anybody else did either. It's just a great machine, that's all. We've just got to watch it and watch it run dry. Like when you say, though, it's a great machine, forgive me saying so, it's easy for you to welcome it because you've got a job. Well, I suppose so, yeah. Yeah. And you know that uh, other people who are, uh, are glass cutters and have been for many years in other parts and in other factories have, in fact, uh, face the prospect of redundancy. Yeah, but fortunately enough, at this factory, nobody has, you know. So uh, I don't know about other factories. The introduction of new technology is so sensitive an issue that Pilkingtons wouldn't allow us to film any of their production lines. Nor would they discuss it. But they want to link the automatic cutting machines to the end of the float glass line. When the machines come, glass cutters will have a skill they cannot sell. The unions know this. That's why they're wary about the introduction of new technology. The glass cutters know this. 200 cutters in one Pilkington's factory will be reduced to 50 over the next three years. For the rest, for the remaining 150, they'll be offered new, probably unskilled jobs. The men who've traditionally been the aristocrats of glassmaking must now be satisfied with something more humble.
the company recognised cutters as being people who they selected out of 15-year-old lads who've got the ability to do something just a little bit above the average than just basic menial labouring jobs. But unfortunately, we're going to go back on labouring jobs. It's about pride then, in a way, pride in the job. Pride's a lot to do with it, yeah. Have you accepted the fact now that you're going to lose your job? Oh yes, well, <coughs> I think this is being the job we've been in like for so long. I think it's been uh, it's been on the cards for so long. We've lived with it for so long that we knew it would come sometime. But uh, when it does come, it's still like a bit of a shock in its in its sense, kind of thing. What sort of jobs? were offered to you? Well, other jobs on the warehouse are available for us, you know, to work on the warehouse. Such as? Well, uh, shooting, packing, these type of jobs. Excited about that? Well, uh, I'm not really excited, and yet it's a job, you know, so, I mean, this is the main thing, that you have a job, really, basically. Well, the job I was doing before I went cutting was packing, so, uh I could probably claim that job back if I wanted it. I was also offered this uh, new machine, this new Biosonic machine. Operating it? Uh, yes, something like that. I mean, uh, I'm 58 now, I've only seven years to do. So uh, I'm probably glad to be in a job at all, isn't it? The thing that bothers me more than anything is not so much losing the job, I think we all accept that, because of technology, and most of the technology that's come has been beneficial for everyone. I think the thing that really does me, what they do after, suddenly to off that job and put on a job which is menial by comparison. It's unfortunate that the company don't provide us with some kind of training scheme so they can provide us with a job that suits the skill we've had. What are you going to do in five years' time then, if you've looked that far ahead uh, and you don't want to take the labouring job? What are you going to do? Big problem. Big problem. Because at my age, I'm 32 now, and to do any other job other than a, a labouring job, I'm going to obviously going to have to take some more education. On the next item on the agenda is the company's response to the questions asked at the last CNC on the new technology. The CNC of February the 1st. Yeah. Well, as you know, Warburton said on February the 1st that we were against the concept of new technology Indeed, it could be beneficial to our members if it was worked in the right way. We put a few proposals to the company. Albert the company Donovan relates to his committee what had happened at the meeting at Pilkington's the previous day. The details of the exchange, for instance, between David Warburton for the union and David Pilkington for the company. But they made it loud and clear to my mind that there is no way he'll... Uh, agreed to a shorter working week. Warburton turned out and said on that basis he really can't see the point of holding another meeting on it. Which David Pilkinson turned around and said, well, look, we've got to talk about it. It won't go away. It is coming. Warburton responded with the union, well, our members will not cooperate. But he said they are our aspirations. Yeah, well, that brings us back to the shorter working week and the early exactly. time. Exactly. That's the ball game, right? So, obviously, we're looking for this to yeah. compensate for the redundancies. Yeah, yeah. But, as I say, the company are not hearing us on that. I'm not speaking our language on that. They're full of sympathy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> They're very sympathetic. Oh, but they're uh... sympathetic if I was all in the Even if we forego, a, say, a pay rise on one year. No, which I, I know I'm talking a bit, bit out of line here, like, but if we for, go a pay rise for one year, that pay rise, surely that might compensate to, to allow for the fifth set to come in. Well, I suppose we can uh, talk well, along them lines, but then again, you'll have probably an in, immense problem convincing your membership of that. True. But it's, uh, it's something we've got to do. We've, We've got to uh, bring on to them the gravity of the situation. We're talking about... The pressure on the union is twofold. They have to persuade their members that jobs matter more than money. They must also bargain over the new machinery, but not so hard that it drives Pilkingtons to invest abroad rather than in St Helens. But the company have given a commitment to the town. They plan to invest more than £100 million here over the next five years. The union know Pilkingtons could just as easily invest their money abroad. 
The company know that the investment in St Helens must mean a drop in the workforce. But they acknowledge they have a duty to deal with the problem. As company chairman Sir Alastair Pilkington says, We must try to ensure that unemployment does not become chronic and is not allowed to generate intolerable tensions in society. They've already moved to relieve these tensions. They've looked at the United States, where two-thirds of all new jobs emerge in small companies employing fewer than 20 men. And they've set up the St Helens Trust to encourage new small businesses. They've backed it with £50,000 of Pilkington's money. Working with the banks, the unions and local government, Pilkingtons have given these premises to house eight fledgling companies. It's called Bold House, and ironically, it's on the fringe of the factory where most jobs are at risk. A firm making security alarm systems was first to move in in June. They occupied two rooms. They generated five new jobs, five out of 170 in the Trust's first year. The Trust is run by Pilkington's people and backed by Pilkington's money. Coincidentally, the first company to move in belongs to a man who left Pilkington's three years ago, Alan Burroughs. If, uh, if they go the right way about it, and they don't necessarily wait for, uh, wait for redundancy and do some uh, thinking themselves and perhaps uh, consider where they could use their talents best, and I feel sure there are many people in industry who could come outside of, of big industry and, and make, uh, make a go of small business. In another room in Bold House, Norman Kelly will start a business distributing protective clothing. How many people do you think you'll be employing? Three, eventually. Uh, starting off, of course, I'll start off on my own. Then I expect to be th have three by the end of the year. How, do you how is it that you find yourself in this position at all, going out, setting out on your own? At, uh, dare I, I ask you what age? 52. Um, yes, well, you need, everyone needs a prod, and my prod was the firm went into liquidation. The trust also helped existing companies prosper. Bernard Ledwith put the financial facts of his coach building and repair firm before the trust, and then decided to follow their advice to expand to twice the size he is at the moment. We could actually sit back, invest the money in something uh, safe, should we say, and get a fair return on it. But instead, we've decided to develop, and uh, with the help of the trust, to keep developing. And how many new jobs do you think uh, it'll create? Uh, at least four, uh, two immediately, uh, two later on in the, in the year. I think with small industries, if they could get them to employ perhaps one or two, it would take the unemployment down considerable. So far, there are 500 new jobs in the pipeline and the Trust are considering a United Kingdom Trust, backed by more than £2 million of private industry's money, able to invest as well as advise. For the conventional answer to unemployment has always been to invest, to entice new industries. But the problem of the 80s will be male unemployment, and so far, new investment in St Helens has created jobs mainly for women. Take this Swedish firm, Janstorp International. It's created 200 jobs for women, eight for men. And there's nothing permanent about Janstorp. A year ago, they threatened to shut down. Productivity, they told the union, must improve. They then followed what the Swedes call serious conversations. The union cooperated and the jobs were saved. Managing director Lars Ekblatt is attracted by cheap British labour and understandably he feels unions in Britain are more flexible than in Sweden. Uh, haven't we got a situation where you have the trade unions here where you want them because you know that they need you yeah. to succeed because you represent jobs? Mm. Yes, perhaps it is so, perhaps it is so. But uh, on the other hand, we need them <laughs> also to, to, to create production and to, to survive. So we, we need the, the labor and the labor needs, needs us. So uh, I think we have quite a happy family, are going to be a quite a happy family. Uh, I mean, do you recognize this? Do you think that the unions recognize this during the conversations that you have yeah. with them? Yeah, during that serious conversation we had, I am sure they, they understood that they need, they need us very, very much. But basically their backs were against the wall. Yeah, you could put it that way. 
Across St Helens, the Pilkingtons' negotiations were going badly. The Union had met the company again, and they now called a meeting of the Union Industrial Committee in the Town Hall. David Warburton, from head office, was to meet representatives from every Pilkington factory. The message that day was clear. Pilkingtons anticipated a job loss of 1,400 over three years. No special relationship between town and company could conceal that. The Union decided not to give way. The introduction of new technology would still be outlawed until agreements with the company could be reached. The company has written to us and said that um, they were very disappointed at our response. But then they say, and this is the crux, the company has no plans to change this offer. In other words, they're not prepared to move from the position of talking to us about early retirement and relating that to our initial claim for progression towards reduction in working week, etc., etc. Now, it seems to me that the company have got a problem in this area because they're anxious to get a settlement on this one. Now, I don't feel that there's any necessity to rush back to that negotiating table on technology at this stage. The company has a problem, there's no the opposition. Ron, would you like to start the debate off? What my and everybody else's worry is, is the job loss in the town. Considering the poor response by the company on our technology claim, isn't it about time that we, the UIC, started to hold meetings to try and reach a common policy on how to stop this job rot which we've experienced for the last three or four years. Could I, just a minute. And we've not got to kid ourselves. This company wants to offload men. They've told us that time and again. And there's only one thing you'll cure that, the 32 hour week. Where do we go? I'm very sorry, I didn't enjoy it. this shorter working week, kids have been born and left school since we last halted the working week. And there's no jobs for them. Because we've never done it since. We've done nothing in 16 years on the working week. And neither is the TUC or anyone else. It's all the rubbish. But what it's really all about is screwing the company for as much money as we possibly can for the future of this town. They make £90 million this year at our expense. At our expense. When I say ours, I mean the town. <laughs> we've made this town and they're raping it. And the people are being left behind. I have a lad 12, leave school possibly in four years' time. No future whatsoever in this town, but none at all. What are we going to do about it, James? Which, of course, was the key question. The As the meeting wore on, the debate focused on the company's offer of voluntary redundancy to shrink the workforce. For if you take a golden handshake, you're selling not only your job, but the job itself. So it seems to me that what we've got to start thinking about shortly is outlawing the voluntary redundancy unless it's for certain cases, obviously we've all got one or two in the works where we think it's probably justified through sickness and things like that, but we've got to concentrate on replacing people. Could I just say on this question of voluntary retirement, there's always going to be a large number of people who will do that regardless of what branches say. You can pass all the resolutions in the world saying, no, 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 you must not do it. You can't stop people doing it. If I don't know how you stop it. I remember going on with David Walter the CNC, uh, along to see some members who were going to be made redundant, and they told us to bugger off, but in stronger language. Uh, they was going to have the pot of gold, and they took the pot of gold. They didn't want to know us when we talked about saving jobs. And that's a situation you'll face time and time again. Isn't it about time that we show the lead and grasp the bull by the heart? I know it's a worldwide and a country problem, but if you can't solve it in Pilkinson's, you'll not solve it anywhere. And we've got to stop the rot here. The chance to retire early is hard to resist. Over the past 10 years, hundreds of Pilkinton's employees have retired before 65 as the workforce has dwindled by almost half. Jack Clift was a glass beveler. He worked 48 years for the company. He took a golden handshake of several thousand pounds and stopped work two and a half years early. No one replaced him. But as he says, if you've any regrets, there's no better cure for insomnia than a pillow full of pound notes. That, plus a day at the lakeside to reflect on your good fortune. They were asking anybody, anybody that would take voluntary retirement, and of course there was the usual backhanders. And, uh, 
money, you mean? Yes. Could I ask you, uh, Jack, when you considered this whole prospect of voluntary redundancy, um, did you consider that really you were taking money to get rid of the job completely? Because after you left it, now nobody's doing the job. I didn't really consider that personally. I did all my own work and found out that I, I'd be just as well off. Uh, you caught something? No, I haven't, unfortunately. I had. I think it got gone because I didn't strike properly. So, from that point of view, uh, I, I, uh, I thought, well, I'd better take redundancy because uh, I was going to get another two or three years retirement. At least I've had it now. Uh, lots of people retire when they're 65 and so on. They don't get two years before they're dead. Mm. At least I've had four years now. and I've thoroughly enjoyed it. I'm, as you can see, I'm a millionaire this afternoon. I'm better off than most people. I, I enjoy myself. Well, I enjoy myself to the full every day. When you thought about what you've done, uh, taking the voluntary redundancy and accepting that you're, I guess, a happy man, mm -hmm. uh, is there even a trace of, um, I can't think of a better word for it, guilt in having taken voluntary redundancy and, uh, and left, having left the job? A little bit. You see, I, I, I was very happy in, in my job. As I say, uh, I was so happy there if they'd have paid for me uh, keep I'd have gone to work anyway. For you nothing, know, you mean? For nothing. You know, I, I, was, so, I was so happy in my job that uh, I didn't want to leave. But uh, as things were, they, it would have been silly for me to carry on for the next two or three years. But there are the school children. There are the children leaving school looking for jobs. Uh, there are. There are. But, uh, well, uh, things will have to be reorganised. We reorganise uh, the work. We've got to reorganise the hours. I mean to say... Uh, when I first started work, well, it was a uh, 12-hour day. Saturday mornings as well. You mean you've got to share the work around? Of course we have. Each and everybody's got to share the work around. Otherwise, half of, half of us is going to be working to keep the other half. Who's going to keep me? Eh? As an old-age pensioner when I'm 96, somebody's got to put some money in the kitty, haven't they? These boys will grow into a world where factory work will be scarcer than their fathers ever knew where unemployment could reach six million by 1990. They'll face new tensions as new technology changes the nature of a working life. Industry created this town. Now, the advances in industry are undermining the town's confidence in itself. Understandably, the men leading the fight for the unions use the experiences of their own childhood as a yardstick by which to judge the job crisis of the 1980s. They readily remember the unity of the 30s, even though work was scarce and so was money. Bill Bradburn. People were happier then. They were more together. They didn't have a television, they didn't have a radio. And I can remember listening to one cup final in a street on a cat's whisker radio. I mean, well, 200 of us trying to find out what was going on. I remember listening to the Braddock fight. Equally the same, and people didn't have the money, but they were together, they helped one another out more. A lot of poverty. A lot of, hell of a lot of poverty. And in the area where I was brought up, that was in uh, Everlane Street, on, off Scotland Road. In Liverpool. In Liverpool, yeah. And you'd maybe get out of, uh, I don't know, maybe 10,000 dockers in those days. Maybe a couple of hundred would get a day's work, according to what work was available. And the chief just says, I want you, or I want you, or I want you, and all the rest of you come back tomorrow. Did and you go down to watch that? Yeah, I watched it. I How used to go down because me, at that time, I'd be about in eight or nine, that earlier. And we used to go down because when they were coming back, the lunches that they didn't need for that day, they used to give them the kids. And that's how the times were. Made an impression on you? An everlasting impression, yes. An everlasting impression. It'd be there till I die. St Helens Town Hall, July 26th. The pay talks with the company have broken down, so the union conveners meet and decide to order a series of one-day strikes over wages, 
Does that mean that the fight over new technology has been forgotten? My members are not tech. They know the fundamental job issue and they know the value of jobs. In my branch especially, we've battled on against redundancies for years now. And it's a very live issue. And I don't think this would detract or this action would detract from any future actions that the members may wish to take in pursuit of a shorter working week. Is today's decision a shot across the bows of the company? Yes. It's a declaration of intent as far as I'm concerned, not only on wage, but our determination to fight job loss and intelligence. Ron Jones' motivation couldn't be more personal. His son, Alan, 12 years old, leaves school in four years' time. Jones is as pessimistic about the town's future as he's passionate about the need to share what work there is. As he says, they've just built an extension to the town's employment exchange. Well, approximately 2,000 school leavers have left school in the last couple of weeks. And I'm led to believe there are jobs for 200. So all the school leavers have got to look forward to in the next three, four years, and indefinitely as far as I'm concerned, is a worsening of the situation. I believe that the working class, or the John Doe and the street, should benefit from technology and not the chosen few. Benefit in what way? By assuring in the wealth of technology. There's cash and giving them security. And um, people are shouting for a 32-hour week. That's only beginning. The TUC uh, admit that uh, even a 35-hour week uh, would increase labour costs by what? Uh, six or seven percent. Now you're arguing for a 32 hour week. The manufacturers say that this will make Britain even less competitive. Well, it depends what they mean by less competitive. How competitive is a company who makes 90 million pounds profit? How much of that goes into securing the future of the people that created the wealth? That's the problem. What do they mean by com competitive? What do they want big profits like that for? Is it needed? Where should it go? So you're saying cut the profits and remain competitive? Yeah. Uh, have you got to produce £90 million pounds profit to be competitive? How many of generations of uh, your family have worked for Pilkington's? Three. Do you think they're a good firm? Well, it depends what you mean by a good firm. Uh, as employers go, they're quite good, yes. Do you mean that you don't think that any employer really could be classified well, how, as, as a good firm? How can a worker equate the situation that an employer employs a man just for profit motive? Not for him as an individual. He wants to make a profit out of him. Do you believe that? Well, I'm convinced of it, yes. What makes you so sure? Well, technology is proving it. What do you mean? Well, they're making bigger and bigger profits with fewer men. Have you, as a union official, do you think, done enough to make your members aware of this new industrial revolution? Nowhere near enough. I think I've failed. I've tried my best, but I don't think it's been good enough. Where have you failed? By not giving automation and job loss situation the attention that it's required. The priority? Yeah. We are the only site which recruits production trainees, school leavers, on a permanent basis. It's only five a year, but nevertheless, it's five a year more than anybody else. And we believe... Ron Jones' factory, City Road, is also the only Pilkington works where the men have voluntarily limited overtime for the past three years. At their branch meeting, the shop floor confirms the policy, a maximum of eight hours per man per week. But Ron Jones believes the union has been ineffective. Other factories haven't supported their stand. Yeah, the trade unions and... You people have been guilty, uh, are guilty of lack of response to the situation. There's no doubt about it. The unions have done very little. I'm proud to say we've done our little bit. We can, we can do what we can in 180 branch, but we cannot force or tell other branches what to do. Well, we're, all, we're, all, we're all members of the same union. Yes, and we've been trying for three years to get them to think our way, and they won't. So, all right, then there's something wrong with the union. There's something wrong with the branches. That no, there's something you, must be wrong with the union if they're not all cooperating, surely. You've got a plant next door that won't do it. If we're not cooperating, as a union, we're of no value at all. What I want from you now is, from this branch meeting, is support of the shop stewards 
we've Decisions got to win, or I've yeah. got to win, or those people who think the same way as I do, I've got to win. We owe it to the youth of this town. It's more important than overtime and extra cash. St Helens rugby league side toil in the August sunshine to prepare for the new season. They reached the semi-final of the Challenge Cup last season and they can do better this year. In fact, they must do better. You see, it's a matter of self-respect because St Helens traditionally are winners. The town expects it of them and they'll spare no effort to live up to those expectations. For, as in most contests, there are no prizes for coming second. How far would you be prepared to go in order to achieve a shorter working week? My, my own, I'm not speaking for my branch, for Bill Bradburn's point of view, I'd go to the limit. I'd go to the limit. I'm prepared to go to any length, any length whatsoever as an individual, and influences many people along the way. Even if it means a long strike? Even if it means a long strike. Because that's what's got ahead of us anyway. We're all going to be sat on the park benches anyway, because there's going to be no jobs there. The first one-day strike at Pilkington's was on August the 7th. All the factories stopped work. The unions were determined to take industrial action till the company offered more money. The company were equally adamant, no more cash. The confrontation lasted three weeks. Then the company gave way. They increased their cash offer to 15%. But the test case on technology has still to be settled. Behind Pilkington's, the Confederation of British Industry, who have pledged their members to resist the shorter working week. Behind the pickets, the growing conviction among trade unionists that work must be shared. The industrial action so far has been about money today. It's also about jobs tomorrow. Shall I run through the redundancy throughout the group? 1980 flat glass division, estimated reduction, 72. Normal wastage, 205. 81, estimated reduction, 308. Normal wastage, 216. 1982 at UK5, 549 estimated reduction. Normal wastage, 203. 1981 estimated reduction, 50. Normal wastage, 54. Optical division. Estimated reduction, 1980, 24, normal wasted, 20. Nineteen eighty one, estimated reduction, 28, normal wasted, 20. Total, estimated reduction, 1980, group wide, 1191. Normal wastage, 401. 1982, Albert. Yeah. yeah. And what's going to happen in 1983 and 1980? Hey, we're nearly up to 1984 now, aren't we? All tomorrow, in the third of this series of programmes, The Right to Work, a report from Blackpool on the TUC's response to the rapidly changing face of British industry. Well, that's tomorrow at 10.20 on BBC Two.